following sermon was delivered at the 1030 worship service at the United Methodist Church of Kent. Please enjoy. So it's the fourth Sunday of Lent, the season for reflecting on life, your life of faith and your relationship with God, a time to search and a time to wonder and seek to discover, to lament and to cry out, to repair broken and wounded and weary places in our life. A season to see what God is up to and where we are being called to connect. A season to perhaps begin taking a deep breath. Take a deep breath right now, do it. Inhale deeply and hold it for a second and exhale to take some moments to breathe and to consider what Jesus is calling us to do with our life. Let's pray. Holy and amazing God, we thank you for waking us up this day, for sending us on our way to be your disciples. And now on this holy ground, anoint our ears to hear, our mouths to speak, and anoint our hearts to be opened to your teaching. Humble us in our need to be right and have it all figured out. For God, we come to you needing more of you and less of ourselves and needing to learn a word about you this day. In the mighty name of Jesus and the Holy Spirit power, we pray. Amen. Today in the scripture, we encounter Jesus having a conversation with a Jewish rabbi named Nicodemus. We know that any piece of scripture that we read and worship is part of a bigger story and a bigger conversation. That this is the story that began a few verses before of Jesus and Nicodemus having some conversation. I, as anybody else watching The Chosen, I've not watched all of it. I'm only on season two, but I have been introduced to Nicodemus. And Nicodemus is portrayed in The Chosen as a curious, confused, eager, and unsure character who is in awe of Jesus. He's a Hebrew scholar and has studied about the awaited Messiah his whole life long. And the creators of the chosen imagine Nicodemus as someone open to believing that Jesus is indeed who he says he is. But for Nicodemus to step out and believe that like the disciples did would change Nicodemus's life drastically. Nicodemus would have to give up so much wealth and power and prestige and his place in the temple. But Nicodemus knows that something holy is in his presence and that Jesus is somehow connected to this Moses that we learn about and the prophecy, and that there is just something familiar about Jesus. He can just feel it. And so Nicodemus comes at night after hearing stories about Jesus, after watching him at a distance, and he comes alone at night, hoping that other religious leaders don't find out that he's there or that he has been there. Perhaps there's a campfire or a candlelight. Nicodemus and Jesus are having a conversation that we get to overhear today, that we get to learn from. We are eavesdropping on business that is not ours, but perhaps it is our business. The scripture today in John is not a sermon on the mount. It is about a relationship between two people, 
one who is trying to understand the other, and the other who is wooing and explaining and trying to tie the past to the present moment and the future story of God. Let's start with the past. Today we hear the Hebrew scriptures from Numbers, the story of snakes, and again two people, Joshua and Moses. This again is a conversation between two people. It's a piece of the Israelites' journey from enslavement and captivity, imprisonment by the Egyptians, into wandering toward a mysterious promised land. A story of a complaining people who are weary and tired of this journey. They are always in need of food and shelter and water and hope and a life in this promised land. They are impatient. Being imprisoned by Egypt felt better than this prison, this walking and this uncertainty. They had forgotten how bad it was in Egypt before they left. And that God makes a way where there seems to be no way. Using an image of a serpent snake, the very thing that was causing death in the community, to heal the community. Light matters. We hear a lot at the end of this scripture of John about light and darkness. Lighting matters. All of us are excited for 7 and 8 o'clock tonight to come when it's still going to be light outside. Even in the video clip and in movies, light matters in the telling of stories. We see the video clip and we watch and it's dark and there's sparks flying and the red bronze and all of its effect for the story. And the lens from which we see and experience life matters. The video segment and hearing Joshua's perspective that we didn't get in the scripture reading. And then Moses who has a more intimate relationship with God. He has experienced God in the burning bush and up on the mountain getting the Ten Commandments and leading the Israelite people and getting courage to talk to Pharaoh to begin with, demanding their exit from Egypt. They come to this same experience in the desert and in the wilderness with very different perspectives and that they share and they hear from each other. All of us in this room come at this life with different perspectives, different lived experiences, different houses we grew up in, different choices we made along the way. But the arc of God's story is consistent, that God meets people where they are and makes a way where there seems to be no way. I think about the reading of this scripture from Numbers, from from the lens of a lived experience of a returning citizen, someone who has spent time in the judicial system, incarcerated and repenting, repairing and serving their sentence, and re-entering life and finding their way. Much like the Israelites in the wilderness, wandering and needing food and shelter, and better yet, a home, a job, transportation, someone to give them a second chance for reconciliation and forgiveness and for hope. God making a way where there seems to be no way. This church, the United Methodist Church of Kent, has a symbol of the cross and flame out front. And you're getting ready to host an event in April about navigating the chaos of reentry. The biggest challenges for someone coming out of incarceration is finding housing, finding a job, and transportation. The lack of support, the lack of hope, and the lack of opportunity 
they could sound like and feel like the Israelite people. Why did you drag us out of Egypt to die in this God-forsaken county? No decent food, no job, no water, no housing, no opportunity to prove myself. As my friend Joe Tucker at South Street Ministries in Akron says, we Christians talk about forgiving sins, but we separate that from illegalities. Here, the modern day message version of John 3, 16 to 17. This is how much God loved the world, that he gave his son, his one and only son. And this is why so that no one need be destroyed. By believing in him, anyone can have a whole and lasting life. God didn't go to all the trouble of sending his son merely to point an accusing finger, telling the world how bad it was. Jesus came to help, to put the world right again. Anyone who trusts in him is acquitted. God comes to offer all of us abundant life. We can lean into our faith and our spiritual life to heal our own brokenness while we walk with others in their brokenness. We can repair our own sadness and confess our own longings while journeying with others and their longings and in their reality and their truth. As Christ followers, as disciples, we get to do this work. It's not a we have to or we could or we should, is we get to do this work of inviting people into abundant life, into the light when we tell them about how Jesus changed our own life. What is your story about how Jesus changed your life? When God made a way when there seemed to be no way. When I go to South Street Ministries in Akron, and I sit in a re-entry meeting with women who are trying to repair their lives, trying to decide when it's the right time and they've had enough healing to get their kids back, to find jobs and to find self-esteem outside of addiction and evil deeds often caused by childhood trauma, I am at all in God at work right before my eyes. God is making a way where there seemed to be no way for these women. When the God who so loved the world showed up in people who love and don't, don't point fingers and accusing fingers, the world is made right again. And I know that I'm standing on holy ground. The Hebrew scriptures remind us of our story and of God restoring life with a bronze snake. That something that seems pagan and wrong, God makes right. A symbol or image given to the people to bring healing and life, God makes all things new. And God makes a way where there seems to be no way through faith. The gospel story of Jesus speaking to Nicodemus explains how Jesus will fulfill those scriptures that the Son of Man on the cross, like Moses and the snake, will be raised up and death will have new meaning. There will be life and there will be resurrection. And Nicodemus, who couldn't quite bring himself to follow Jesus like the disciples did, gets a second chance because our God continues to make all things new and doesn't give up on us Jesus later on in Jesus Nicodemus later on in Jesus's life and ministry Nicodemus stands up for Jesus when the Pharisees want Jesus arrested 
And in John 19, it is Nicodemus who brings hundreds of pounds of myrrh and aloe with which to wrap Jesus' body. Nicodemus embodies compassion because Jesus had compassion on Nicodemus. And God made a way for Nicodemus, and God makes a way for you and for me and the people at South Street Ministry and at Portage County to have second chances and makes a way where there seems to be no way. You have a symbol of the cross and flame outside of this church. It is a symbol that is seen around the world in the United Methodist Church. It is a symbol that led people to partner with the United Nations and the United Methodist Church to help end malaria in Sub-Sahara Africa. Through the Nothing But Nets campaign, the people of the United Nations saw this cross and flame everywhere and said, well, if we get nets to these people, they can distribute them and make it happen. That is the work of UMCOR in the United Methodist Church, making a way where there is no way. When I was in the Holy Land last February, I woke in the night to feel my bed shaking. My roommate and I said that felt like an earthquake. And so I got my phone out and I Googled earthquakes in Israel. And sure enough, there'd been a 7.8 magnitude earthquake in, Haiti, in Turkey, and we were feeling the after effects. Just a year ago, that happened. And UMCOR, the United Methodist Committee on Relief, was there to respond with other trusted partners in Turkey to help people not use candles while living in tents and kerosene lights while living in tents, which is dangerous, and provide solar lanterns to people who were suffering from the ramifications of the earthquake in Turkey. We are embodying compassion and being God's light through UMCOR. And this church is called to be God's light right where it is. So I say, what does the city of Kent, your community, Portage County, say that your symbol, the cross and the flames, mean that are outside of the walls of this church as they drive by? Is this church a place for refuge, for holy ground, for hope, a place for students to park? How are you impacting the community beyond the walls of the building? Are you a church where people would say, that's a place to go for second chances? Are you a church that people would say, I was there and it felt like holy ground when that choir sang? Are you a church that is being God's agents of change in the world? And are you a church where others would say, people there are being transformed and they are on fire and ready for what God has in store for them after this Lenten season. As we respond to Jesus with a helping hand, a listening ear, a heart that is open to see goodness and hope in people, in God's beloved people, Jesus will meet us in those moments. Because the world is messy, it is broken, and it is overwhelming to watch the news. There are conflicts with each other, divided families, wars, hunger and violence and racism and disease and dis-ease, and a messy campaign season yet ahead. And yet, God loves the world. God loved the world, and God continues to love the world. And God needs you to be an answer to prayer and for the church to matter. For the church to have power like a bronze snake. For the church to have power like Jesus on the cross. For the church to bring new life. To bring people out of darkness and into the light. We as disciples must go to dark places and bring people into the light to be courageous and bold, to love and bring people out of darkness. And so on this fourth Sunday of Lent, we need to stop and take breath, because that's a lot to ask. 
And I believe it's unsustainable without a prayer life, without inviting God to transform us so that we can be a part of transforming our communities. To take a moment to breathe and to think about how God is asking us to respond to life with each other and our spiritual practices, to be an answer to prayer. But I know if we do that, that Jesus will meet us in the wilderness at night and during the day, in the light and in the darkness. Jesus will meet us in our complaining and Jesus will take us by the hand and invite us into an intimate conversation and lead us closer to the cross of Good Friday and to the power of an empty tomb. Because our God is in the business of making a way where there is no way. God so loved the world. Say it with me. God so loved the world. Who can you say that to this week? God loves the world. As you take deep breaths, inhale, God so loved the world, and exhale and tell someone else about it. Amen. Thank you for listening to this edition of the United Methodist Church of Kent Sermon Podcast. For more information about the church, visit www.kentmethodist.org.